While old man Haig's world was composed of theories, laws and experiments, Dad's private universe was constructed from simple earthly things. He had no time for daft ideas, or bloody daft ideas, as he would say. At the fixed centre of his galaxy were home and family, and around these wheeled all the things which formed the details of his portrait. His car, the garden, drills, lawnmowers, pit boots, snap-tin, darts, harmonica, seed boxes, bird tables, firewood. Firewood. That's the one thing that impressed me most when I was in short trousers. Dad could chop sticks with the swift precision of a TV chef slicing courgettes. And I dreamed of the day when I could do the same. I have a black and white photograph of us in the garden, with the old man towering behind me, muscular and immortal, his huge brilliant hands on my shoulders. It is rare that a day passes when I do not feel the gentle weight of those hands, just for a moment, in the middle of some daily event, opening a door, running a bath, answering the phone, or stroking the miraculous hair of the woman beside me now. I turn out the lamp and hold my wife's hand, gently, so I don't wake her. The only thing I can see is the outline of her hair and shoulders. The only thing I can think of is the old man. His smell fills the room, the smell he acquired at fourteen, two days after finishing school, when his old man woke him at three-thirty in the morning and took him on his first shift down the mine the first of more than 10,000 shifts. 45 years of days, afters and nights. Work. That was Dad's smell. Work. The kind of work a heavy horse does. The kind of work I can hardly conceive of. Graft, sweat, lift, dig, shove, carry. Little more than corporate slavery. And when he wasn't working at work, he was working on the car or working in the garden, or working in the shed. When he stopped going out on sunny afternoons and preferred to sit in his armchair, I knew it was all over. Perhaps it was the extended family of tumours in his guts, or perhaps it was a surfeit of odours. Too much plastic, petrol, rust, too many empty jars and wild gardens in June. Either way, he was thoroughly worn out by it all. One day in the hospital, a nurse asked him what he wanted. I want to peg out. The nurse looked horrified, but knowing him, I thought it was funny, and if his muscles had withered to sad balloons, his wits had not. Not yet, anyway. But a few days later, he didn't know what day it was, and the only thing he wanted was to go home. Take me home, he kept saying. When am I going home? So we took him home with a week's supply of morphine. Most of it wasn't necessary. A day later he was sucking on the last dregs of his energy through a broken straw. A few hours later I was sucking on the dregs of a treble whiskey, numb to the soul. I heard the men in black suits slip in through the front door, whispering. A few minutes later I heard them zipping up the bag, a sound I knew I would always hear from time to time. When they'd gone, I stood in the doorway of the front room. I stared at the empty bed and wondered why I'd just let some complete strangers walk in and take him away like that. They couldn't chop sticks like the old man used to. But I was speechless and didn't know what to do. Yesterday, two years later, I was walking down the street feeling exceptionally happy for no reason at all or perhaps just because it was warm and sunny and the cherry blossom was out. Suddenly, one of those instantaneous things, I heard that sound again. It ripped past my head, above a line of cars and over the rooftops, with a trail of pink flowers in its wake. I stopped and sat on a wall, undid both shoelaces and tied them up again. I thought about Dad at the seaside with a big smile on his face. Then I thought about old man Haig, then I thought about the story of gold, and I realised what I should have done that morning. I shouldn't have let them take him away in a cheap leather bag. I should have told them to leave him alone, 
scattered their wings with a stone. Then I should have taken his ring, gone to the shed, hammered out a sheet of gold, and covered him in that. Bloody daft idea, Dad would have said. But to me it would have made the most sublime sense, a luminous pearl in the night of my mystery. Absurd, beautiful, madly poetic. A final rest to everything. The World Covered in Gold was written and read by Philip Corker. The producer was Claudio Furet.